In this class period, we are going to now take each of our seven steps in our teaching progression and update them <coughs> to higher level and look at them from a different perspective. So, and also we want to start applying it. A lot of the problem first semester with your math lesson is that there was not enough explanation and teaching technique in it. So um, I've given you these seven steps, and they're not sequential, I realize this. They're more of a progression of how you progress through a chapter and how you progress through a new topic. So I want you to think about those steps when you prepare your math lesson. I also need to know dates that you are available and which grade you want to teach because you will teach the actual lesson for the class that day and you will actually teach them how to do their homework which it will actually be graded and so forth so it's going to be a real lesson just as if you were student teaching that class okay now it's a little hard because you're going to have to jump in the middle when when you're student teaching you'll be teaching every day you've been in there you'll know the students you'll know what they know and they don't know but it, it's going to give you a good practice so when you make up your lesson like I said, I need to know right away when you can, your dates that you are available so that I can get you your topic. So you can start developing it. Think through the seven steps of the teaching progression. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about updating or raising the level of our seven steps to fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade, even eighth grade. And let's talk about applying them when we make up a lesson. All right, what is the first step. It's the law of language. It's terminology. We reviewed what it was last class time. Now let's talk about using it. So using the seven steps in the intermediate level, at the intermediate level. All right, terminology, first of all, is going to become more important as we go into higher and higher grades because the terminology will become less and less common. And so as we are doing our lessons, as you are thinking about teaching something, we want to use these seven steps. I didn't just give you seven nice steps to write down and put in your notebook. Think about using them. Are you going to use them all the time, every lesson? No, but there are things to think through when you're going to teach a lesson. Something else that I want you to um, remember from these teaching classes uh, maybe it's not such a problem at intermediate, but is a problem at lower levels when you already know how to do the math and you think, I can do this, not a problem. This is especially dangerous if you're good in math. All right? You can't approach the class, I know how to do that. Oh, tomorrow I'm just teaching common denominators. Well, I hope you're good at common denominators if you're teaching fifth and sixth grade um, and so forth. So you've got to avoid the pitfall of, I know how to do that and I'm just going to get in there and show them how to do it. That's not teaching. You also have to avoid the pitfall of assuming that they know more than they really know. And that begins with terminology. Don't assume they know what you are referring to, even if it's not a strictly a math term. Hopefully, after all, you'll have a bachelor's degree, you're college educated, you should have a higher vocabulary than your students without even realizing it. So pay attention to terminology just as much at intermediate as at primary. At primary, you're going to be more aware of their lower vocabulary, maybe fifth and sixth grade. Um, sometimes I have a problem with this in seventh grade math that my math vocabulary and my regular vocabulary is above theirs. So pay attention to terminology. Um, terminology is going to become important because as you get into fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade, you are going to be introducing new terminology. Um, we're doing geometry, teaching geometry to intermediate students, teaching geometry to, to junior high students. There's a lot of terminology there. And some of the terminology is more specific and has more meaning in a math class than it does in general uh, English. For example, slope. Slope is a common English word, but it, we have to apply it to geometry. So be especially aware of terminology at intermediate level because you will be doing harder concepts and using 
more and more new terminology that's not part of their vocabulary. So be aware of terminology. Then as you are going to start teaching your lesson, you have to think about how am I going to put this so that they understand it? Do they know that term? Um, sometimes I throw around terms and they don't know what they mean. Don't throw around the term reciprocal. Fifth and sixth graders have no idea what that means. Um, seventh and eighth graders don't remember what it means, or at least they act like it, and so forth. So as you are planning your lesson, think through what terminology do I need to cover. Then as you are in intermediate, teaching intermediate math, you want to have a goal to develop their math vocabulary. One thing that you can do as the fifth and sixth grade or even seventh and eighth grade teachers, you can get them used to proper terminology. So they're used to referring to numbers as add-ins when they're an addition problem. They're used to referring to the minuend and the subtrahend, not the top number and the bottom number. Make an effort to use the proper terminology instead of vague this number, that number, or vague questions like what's the answer. And you have to think about it. So when you're teaching, ask them, what is the difference? Then any time they come across difference in a story problem, even in high school they come across story problems that they have to translate into an algebraic equation. They're used to the word difference, and it automatically is tied to the operation of subtraction. So your goal is to build their math vocabulary. You want to get them used to using the terminology. All right, and um, this is a part of the idea of teaching. Teaching is confirming for joint possession. And as you teach, you're going to want your students to be um, putting things in their own words. Well, their own words are going to be pretty bad if they don't know the terminology and they don't have a good math vocabulary. So you want your students to get used to proper terminology so that you're using it all the time. Then when they get in high school and the teacher says, okay, or maybe junior high actually, we're teaching negative numbers and I tell them to change the sign of the subtrahend. They're not going to know which number to change, or at least they're going to be confused about it. But I need to be able to refer to the subtrahend when I'm talking about subtraction. And I need to be able to re um, the idea when we're doing fraction math. Okay, and um, remember, everybody gets mixed up with this, and this is a trick problem, or it can be. What's the tendency here? It's to bring down the subtrahend instead of borrowing, right? Your brain just wants to do it, sees it, it wants to put it down there. This is not going to be one and three fourths, is it? It's much too big. So. I need to be able to use the terminology and say, you can't bring down the subtrahend, but this problem's entirely different. There's nothing wrong with bringing down the menu end, is there? And I need, so I need to always, when I'm teaching subtraction, I always refer to the menu end and the subtrahend and the difference. Okay, so who knows the difference? Instead of who knows the answer. So work to build their math vocabulary. And then lastly, make sure you're aware of what they understand and what they don't understand with respect to your terminology, with respect to your own vocabulary, even if it's not strictly a math term. So terminology. At intermediate level, there's going to be more terminology. At intermediate level, it's your goal to get them used to proper terminology. If, you have, if they have a good math vocabulary from junior high and fifth and sixth grade when they get to geometry, all right, and here at Fairman Baptist Academy, Mr. Kelso's up there talking about slope or parallel and perpendicular, they know exactly what he's talking about. And they can concentrate on learning how to do the proofs instead of trying to catch up on the vocabulary and catch up on the terminology. So what did we say about terminology? Use it. And what I want to get across with this for intermediate math is there's going to be a lot more terminology. You can't assume they know it. Be aware of it and think through it when you're preparing your lesson. Are there new, term is there new terminology? 
And then remember we said the other day, we're gonna enforce the terminology with ourselves and our students. All right, at intermediate level, what about facts? So let's talk about facts. As you are preparing your lesson as well, you've got to, th I want you to start using my seven steps of the progression when you're thinking about what do I need to write down when I'm preparing my lesson for Mrs. Wright. Most of the time, your stuff, your bo most everyone's lessons, especially the first time, were way too vague. They're like an outline. I want more than that. I want you to actually almost script your lesson that you're going to give in the academy. Now, you're not going to do that every day. You're not going to do it as a student teacher. And you won't do it as you get older and gain your experience. But think through the terminology. Think through the facts. All right, what basic information do they need to know to do this? Okay, so let's talk about facts. What do we want to say about facts in general? We wanted to say that they should be automatic. So now at intermediate level, most of the basic facts should be already automatic. Most of their basic facts should already be automatic. So they should already know their times tables through 12 by fifth grade for sure. And correspondingly, then, they don't necessarily memorize division facts, but they know the multiplication so well that multiplication and division should be fine. Addition and subtraction families are, should be automatic as well. But a little thing to be careful of, watch subtraction in the teens. Many fifth graders, sixth graders, and even junior high students make dumb mistakes when they have to borrow. For example, they have to subtract um, 15 minus 4, which is what? 11. You know how many times I get 9? And it doesn't even make any sense to me. 15 minus 6 is 9. 15 minus 4 is still 11, right? I'll, so be aware of subtraction families being weak, especially in the teens. 15 minus 7, 15 minus 8, um, 16 minus 7, versus 16 minus 5, many times, I don't know what it is, frequently junior high and upper elementary students will be putting down 11 when it's, the answer is 9 and vice versa. It, it just doesn't make sense. So be aware of subtraction facts. Out of all of the simple facts, subtraction in the teens, sometimes I'll have dumb mistakes, but also multiplication tables. Which multiplication tables? Twos? Threes? Fours? No. Five? Certainly not. So they should already be automatic, but at intermediate level, you need to polish them. And frequently, we'll have trouble with the six times tables, the seven times tables. They've got the nines pretty good because of the patterns. And of course, 10 is easy. 11 is really easy. But then they're always missing 11 times 12 <laughs> because it's not in the pattern, right? And 11 times 11. So with facts, they should already be automatic. You should only have to polish them. Be careful of subtraction families in the teens. We don't want to be making careless subtraction er errors when we're trying to do decimal division. Also be aware of some of the multiplication tables might be weak, particularly 6, 7, um, sometimes 8, but 6 and 7 seem to fall through the cracks frequently. Um, your 12s are usually pretty good because 12 is a dozen. Nines are usually pretty good. You do have to watch the top of the 11s and the top of the 12s, OK? Um, at, at our school here, we try to go through 15. If possible, and you are the sixth grade math teacher and their math facts are good, push them into the 13s the 14s and the 15s, even if it's just the 13s. Why? Anybody know why? Why the 13s? 15 is okay, but 13s, even if you can't get to 14 and 15, if you can do the 13s in sixth grade, 13's a prime number, right? 
and often they will have to prime factor all the way up to 13 or reduce up to 13. So with the facts at intermediate level, they should be automatic. You should only be polishing them. So you're going to look for weak areas in their basic facts. facts. Most of them should already have their facts automatic. Look for weaknesses. I gave you uh, illustrations of what are weaknesses. So the first thing about facts is they should already be automatic. You're going to polish them up and you are going to look for weaknesses. Next with facts, take the facts further into what will be high school, what will be high school information. What can you do? Because remember, we've talked about drill being appropriate and drill being effective. We talked last time about drilling on purpose for a purpose. Fifth and sixth grade, don't waste your drill time. Say, so, well, they're, they're, my class is really good with their times tables. My class is pretty good with their math. They're not making silly subtraction errors. What can you do? You can make your drill time useful by being aware of what's going to be coming up in high school and start drilling to the facts that they need in high school. Who can give me an example? I just gave you one. Push the multiplication tables up to 15. What's another one that you could do? Kind of related to, kind of related to the times tables. Uh, yes, S learning the perfect squares and learning the um, cubes, especially the perfect squares, perfect squares through 20. That's something you can do in fifth grade. And they'll, they'll like doing it because it's different. They're going to be bored doing times tables. They're bored with their arithmetic facts. So take, start doing, learning geometry facts. Start learning algebra facts. For algebra, they're, they're going to need to be able to recognize perfect squares. And I would go through 20. 20 times 20 is 400. I'm having kind of a hard time with some of my seventh graders because they're not recognizing some of the perfect squares, even the lower ones. So you can drill squares and then what else? Square roots. You can drill, you can even go to cubes. Now with cubes, you wouldn't really go beyond six, maybe seven, maybe eight, you know, but your lower cubes. It's going to be very helpful for them to know without thinking about it that two cubed is eight, right? Four cubed is 64. Another handy fact, okay? Also the squares. 17 squared is 289. That comes up in uh, algebra factoring a lot. And of course, then the students don't recognize it. So with your facts, yes, by intermediate, by fifth and sixth grade, their basic arithmetic, arithmetic facts should be automatic. You're going to polish them, OK? And you're going to look for problem areas. Then number two, push your math facts into high school realm, all right? So the first thing you want to do is start drilling um, algebra facts, perfect squares, square roots, perfect cubes, okay? Um, what else can you drill then with geometry? You can drill actual geometry definitions. Um, the, the Abeka flashcards has, you know, these, it's got a square on it, and the back of the card says square. What can you do as the fifth grade teacher? Hold up the card and let them just say square? No. You hold up the square card and they say a square is a rectangle with consecutive sides equal. All right, what have we done there? We've given them the real definition of a square. We're incorporating words like consecutive, right? So rather than me saying all the sides are equal, I'm going to give them the proper geometry definition. Consecutive sides equal. That kind of helps. And the reason that I started doing that is because guess who the algebra teacher is? Me. Okay. Guess who the seventh grade teacher is? Me. So hey, I'm very interested in what they're learning in fifth and sixth grade, aren't I? So you want to push them ahead and start um, preparing them for high school. So you can drill algebra facts. You can drill geometry, uh, terms, definitions. You can even teach them geometry theorems. For example, parallel lines have 
Anybody know? Equal, Equal slopes. That's a theorem, right? So um, when I pull out my Abeka flashcard with the two parallel lines on it, I don't just have them say parallel lines. I at least have them say parallel lines never intersect. Parallel lines have equal slopes. Then when I show them the perpendicular, I teach them in the flashcard, not just name the perpendicular. See what I mean? By taking your drill beyond just giving names and starting to teach facts and definitions. Then you are drilling on purpose for a purpose. I told you about that with our basic math principles. That's what I mean by it. You have a purpose. Your purpose isn't, oh, I need to drill. Your purpose is to correct problem areas in your drill. You're going to be doing more drill. In a, you're going to approach drill and your math facts in a different way. You're not trying to get them to learn their measurement facts because you're not teaching second grade. All right? You're not trying to get them to learn their addition families because you're teaching addition and subtraction. You're not trying to teach their multiplication tables because you're teaching them how to do multiplication and you're teaching them how to do long division. You're polishing them and you're pushing them further. Um, so you can teach geometry, you can drill geometry facts, real definitions. Do you know what I mean by that? Real theorems. So when I hold up my perpendicular line flashcard, they don't just say perpendicular lines. They say perpendicular lines form right angles. Okay? That's a theorem from geometry. Right? Um, they also have the intersecting line flashcard. What can we say with that? See how I'm thinking about pushing them ahead into high school level facts instead of standing up there going through the motions of, oh, I'm supposed to drill. Okay? Then um, you see their little intersecting lines flashcard. What do you know about intersecting lines? They form vertical angles. And what do you know about vertical angles? Vertical angles are equal. So if you liked geometry in high school, there's all kinds of things you can add to it. Different things. And then they're going to have a whole lot easier time with the proofs if the facts they need to know to do the proofs have been drilled in their minds even when they were in fifth grade and didn't really know where you were going with it. So you can push them ahead in geometry. Um, you can also do complementary and supplementary. You hold up the angle, and instead of them saying, acute, well, duh, no kidding, it's acute. It's only 35 degrees. What can you have them do when you hold up the 35 degrees? You can say, complement. And what do they have to say? 55 degrees. Supplement, they have to say 45, 145, okay? Do you see what am I doing with my drill? I'm not wasting time with my drill. I'm sharpening their minds, and I'm prepping them for high school, okay? So with facts, they should be automatic with their basic arithmetic facts. I think you know what I mean by that. But you still have to polish those, and you still have to address problem areas. All right, so you'll be polishing them. That's kind of what I mean by that. Polish is your dressing problems. What do you do if one of your students is missing their arithmetic facts? I have a seventh grade girl who does not know her times tables. Am I going to drill times tables to the rest of the class? No, I'm going to talk to parents. I'm going to have her write them. I'm going to have her, do you have flashcards at home? And I'm going to tell her, you've got, you're, going to, you're struggling with long division because you keep, you have to sit there and think and think and think what number to use because your timetables are not automatic. So you need to do something about that. Drill outside of class, get the parents involved and so forth. But um, then you're going to prep them for high school. Start pushing them into high school terminology, whether it's algebra or geometry. There's all kinds of things you can do with geometry. Geometry formulas, right? You can drill those. Um, it's, you can start drilling your percents, your decimal fraction equivalents, which are a little bit, those things are not automatic at intermediate. They're new. So you're going to incorporate your upper concepts into your drill. The last thing about facts. We're saying that their facts should already be automatic. You're polishing them. 
We're saying that their math facts now need to be brought into high school. You can push them further. The third thing about facts is to go beyond the facts by adding mental math. Go beyond the facts by adding mental math. Okay? I just gave you an example with complementary and supplementary. All of a sudden, they have to, in their brain, subtract from 90. And they're learning complementary. And they're polishing their mind. They're learning supplementary. Um, An example of this, bringing our facts up into intermediate level, is, go is going beyond the arithmetic facts, first of all, in measurements. Okay, I hold up the little flashcard that says one foot equals blank inches. Are we drilling that to fifth graders? No. But does that mean we want to ignore some of the basic measurement facts? No, we use them in our mental math section. We push them beyond just the facts. So go beyond saying the facts and use the fact in a mental math problem. Okay, I, pull, I hold up that um, one foot equals blank inches, and I say three quarters of a foot. What's three quarters of a foot? It's eight inches. Right? Wait. Yes. Okay, I'm looking at Maggie. Let's have her check my mental math here. Um, or I'll say five-sixths of a foot, depending on how often we've done that. That's 10 inches, all right? Or we're doing um, gallons, half a gallon. Or we're doing um, cups, I can go backwards. And I can ask them how many cups in a gallon. Or I can say a gallon is how many cups instead of one gallon equals four quarts. I can say, no, one gallon equals how many pints? And I'm pushing them. Or I'll say three gallons. Hello, we're in fifth grade. We know there are four quarts in a gallon, don't we? So we start making them do mental math. So with your facts, we're going to go beyond the facts and use basic facts in mental math, whether it's your measurements, changing up the number in your measurements, um, whether it's your geometry facts. What about your flashcards, your multiplication flax, flashcards? What you can do is you can turn your multiplication or your addition flashcards into multiple combinations. Start with two and then go to four. And when you do that, there's absolutely nothing wrong with you writing the thing that you want to say or do and the answer on the back of the card so that you don't have to do the math, mental math. Okay? You know what I'm saying? So I hold up the flashcard. Let's say they're having trouble with the teens. So I hold up 15 minus 7, and I tell them times 3 divided by 2. There you go. <laughs> okay. So, yes, or you start with one at a time. You hold up a subtraction fraction flashcard, and you tell them to multiply by 4. Or you tell them to multiply by 6. So I hold up 15 minus 9, and I tell them times 6. And then oftentimes I will have to, I will have to have them do it out loud. They won't be able to do that right at first. I'm going to train them. So when you are doing facts, facts have to be automatic, and you're at the top of their arithmetic time. So you want to not just say, oh, I'm glad I don't have to worry about drill. I'm teaching sixth grade. Is that true? Well, hopefully somewhat it is true, but you want to use your sixth grade math drill time to polish up their weak areas, to teach, bring them into high school level terminology, and also you need to challenge them. Go beyond the facts and use your, mental f your facts in some type of mental math exercise. Okay, so terminology, you're still going to use it, and you're going to prepare for it. You're going to think through what you need to address as far as the terminology. Facts. Yes, they should be automatic, but at intermediate level, use the time for drill to push your students further. Then the, the next two we're going to cover kind of at the same time. 
concept balancing with procedure. Balancing concept with procedure. Last class period, we talked about uh, concepts being the properties, the principles, the laws, the foundational concepts that govern how mathematics is done, right? So what are we get? We are going to now balance concept with procedure. What is procedure? Those are the steps. That's the explanations of how the problem is done. So let's balance concept with procedure. First thing, at intermediate level, you are, let's say fifth and sixth grade, you are teaching them the top of arithmetic. You know what I mean by that? The upper level of arithmetic. So that means you will be, at fifth and sixth grade, you will be doing a lot of procedure. You're at the top, or you're coming to the end of their time learning arithmetic. So they should already be comfortable with a lot of the concepts. It's a balance. Balance between concept and procedure. Of necessity, at intermediate level, you're at the end of their arithmetic time. You are teaching decimals. You are teaching percents. And these have a lot of procedures. The second idea here is that not only are you at the top of their arithmetic time, you are also going to be doing a lot of expansion. And teaching expansion is just um, expanding the procedure. The concept doesn't change. Remember? Maybe I should put all three of these together. We have number three was concept. Number four was procedure. Number five was expansion. So the idea here between those three, you are going to be doing a lot more expansion, aren't you? You're going to be adding digits to your division problems. Then you're going to be throwing decimals in, which decimal division is an expansion of whole number long division, isn't it? So you will be doing a lot of procedure. But then the, con the next idea here is you're at the top of their arithmetic, but you cannot, cannot, cannot ignore concept. As a matter of fact, they're older now. They should be able to understand. Sometimes it's a lot easier to understand the concept when you already are comfortable with the procedure. So now that, of course, yes, you're at the top of their arithmetic level. Yes, you're going to be doing a lot of expansion. You're going to have a lot more procedure than fourth grade and third grade. But the other thing is you still can't ignore concept. So you're looking at it now from the other end. So make sure you understand that concept cannot be ignored. And the second idea is that concept should be easier to explain. It should be easier to reach their understanding because they're already comfortable with a lot of those arithmetic procedures anyway. So it's, it's a balance between teaching the concept and practicing and concentrating on procedure. You're going to have a lot more procedure. You're going to be doing a lot of expansion, which the concept hasn't changed. You're just adding steps. But now's the time to go back and make sure that the concept is there. Many concepts are much easier when you already are comfortable with the procedure, and then you can start going back and saying, okay, that's why that works. It's much easier to teach concept after procedures are familiar. So balancing concept with procedure. You're going to be doing a lot more procedure because you are at the upper end of their arithmetic. But don't ignore concept. In fact, use this opportunity. Use this opportunity to solidify concept because concept is easier. Concept is easier to understand when you're already familiar with the procedures. Okay, um, then expansion. Principle number six was expansion. Remember, what was our little phrase for procedure that we ran over last time? One at a time, please, right? So with expansion, with expansion, don't, first of all, don't assume you're still going to follow the one at, a, one at a time, please, idea with procedure. Don't assume, okay? I keep telling you that. You know why? 
that was my biggest problem coming out of college. My, um, of course, I have a secondary ed math science, and first year out of college, I taught fourth grade math, sixth grade math, eighth grade math, and algebra one. And in fourth grade, I had a, the hardest of the the hardest of those four classes were was what fourth grade math. I had to teach them kind of really how to do long division. Third grade, they start doing the long division. They hardly get out of two digit, they hardly do two digit divisors. Fourth grade, they've got to really learn how to do long division. Fourth grade, they've got to really learn how to do fractions. And I was kind of at a loss to how to get them to get a common denominator when they didn't know their times tables as well as obviously as older students do, and they couldn't just see it off the top of their head. Because if you're good at math, a lot of the things that you do, you just see it at the top of your head, like reducing a fraction. But then to actually have to go back and teach them how to do it. And I, I don't remember being taught the divisibility rules. I don't remember seeing them until I taught fourth grade math. I think, oh, why didn't somebody teach me that? Probably somebody did. <laughs> but um, so what you want to do with expansion is you have to be careful that you don't assume they already know the basic procedure, you still have to address it. You might think, oh, this is fifth grade, and lesson number one is adding whole numbers. What should you do? Assign it? Skip it? No, you should teach it, and that'll give you good indication of where their students are with their basic skills and so forth. So with expansion, still follow the one at a time, please, idea that we've mentioned with procedure. All right. Then also with expansion, tethering. We talked about tethering when we're teaching procedure. You're going to be doing a lot of expansion. So a lot of the principles that we talked about with procedure, you need to pay attention to with expansion. Don't assume. And here, now that we have already covered the procedures, we're just getting to harder arithmetic, we need to Keep in mind the idea of tethering the expanded procedures, tethering the new procedures, because now we're going to have more steps. Okay? Um, then, problem areas. Problem areas. Problem areas, first of all, they're going to be more they're going to be more apparent because you will be doing harder problems. You're doing expanded problems. So there's more procedure and the problem areas will become more obvious. Remember, problem areas are situations where the procedure and or concept is difficult and confusion, confusing. Don't avoid them. And just like we said the other day, you're going to see the same problems all the time. What did we say about problem areas? Don't avoid them. All right. Um, I wanted to talk about application in a little bit of detail. Um, so I'm going to save that for the next time. Um, with application, I wanted to talk about one of my favorite things, and that's the tool belt. And this is going to be, uh, remember, with application, they're easy, and how we make them easy is we teach them how to think through a problem. And a lot of that involves having a tool belt. All right? Remember, you're going to be teaching percents. We're going to be covering percents in this class. And there's, you have to have more than one tool in your tool belt. Um, maybe this also fits very well with expansion. Tools in your tool belt. All right, I mentioned reducing fractions. They're going to be reducing fractions that are a lot bigger than they were in fourth grade. So they have to have tools in their toolbox. Um, what do I mean by that? Well, if you're a construction worker or if you're repairing something, you can't just have one size screwdriver, right? You can't just have the flat tipped screwdriver. Sometimes you need a Phillips screwdriver, correct? So when you're reducing fractions at intermediate level, you're going to need more than just your times tables in your tool belt. You're going to need those divisibility rules that I mentioned. 
you're also going to need prime factoring. So we're going to be talking about that, giving them tools in their tool belt so they can be independent problem solvers. Um, one of the biggest problems with the seventh graders, they're always raising their hand and wanting me to, here's how they put it, go through the story problems. What do they mean when they say that? They're wanting me to actually do the thinking and tell them what to do. If we go through them in class, I'll just write it down and then I can do it because the teacher's already kind of hinted or even outright told me what I have to do on problem number 19 or whatever it is. So we want to teach our students, that's the why application's gonna be more important. Expansion is gonna be more important at intermediate level because you've already beyond their basic arithmetic and now you are, yes, polishing, addressing problem areas, but it's a different perspective totally different than the next class primary, okay? So you're coming at it from the other end. So you're gonna be centering in on expansion, okay? You're gonna be centering in on making your students problem solvers. Also, you're gonna to need to balance that concept with the procedure. So at intermediate level, you wanna take the opportunity, once they're familiar with the procedures, to go back and solidify the concept. All right, last semester, several of your classmates had problems on my math skills tests. Why? Their understanding was never reached when they were learning their arithmetic, and so they can't remember how to do things. Math is not about remembering, is it? What is math about? Understanding. understanding. So you want to approach it that way. And as an intermediate teacher, you've got a unique opportunity to go back and solidify concept. As a primary teacher, I'm gonna say this in this class, not in the primary class, good luck, because you gotta start from scratch. And that's my biggest problem with, with the fourth grade math class that I taught coming out of secondary ed and already being good in math, otherwise obviously I wouldn't have majored in it. <laughs> I had a hard time teaching the fourth graders how to do some of that fraction math. Literally, I felt like by, you know, from scratch. I had to start from scratch. So this is gonna be a totally different perspective. You're not starting from scratch. They're already familiar. They already have some math terminology. They already have some math skills. Now you're gonna go and polish them. And you're gonna go back and make sure they understand concepts. And you're gonna teach them to be problem solvers.